Hey, hey everybody. I got some good things for you tonight. This is a show from Prophecy in the News. We're going to look at Gary Stearman and Avi Lipkin about the Middle East goings on now, what they think is going to happen later. Here's what I think. It's been X amount of days since the embassy ordeals and the spreading of the trashing of the United States, the uprisings all over the place in different countries and cities all over supposedly a stupid video it was the crappiest thing that I ever watched I suffered through it I wanted to click and stop but yet I made myself watch the whole thing so that I could see what kind of crap were they trying to pump off as an excuse and a reason for all this stuff to begin happening and I say it's a load if I give credence to the fact that these Islamic believers have such a strong faith to their God and that they are any one shred of a human being, then even though some idiots, for whatever reason, pump out an excuse and a little crappy video like that, that here, this is what fanned the flames of your hate, your destruction, and your death. Well, if they are any part human, they would not do that, even if it is in the defense of the supreme that they worship. The taking of life is sacred, or so we're taught in our religion, but we're not battling, we're talking about why they really did it. And if you, if you think they're human, and they have love in their hearts and whatnot, and they have any intelligence in their brain, in the gray matter between their ears and can logically think and function and assimilate and have common sense no the video is impossible for it to spur all this there's a finger or, or a hand with a whole bunch of fingers in this pot stirring everything up this was intended to what, what I see and I've went over tons of articles is you have to get everybody on the same page like I said before in, in other videos about the end is going to be Islam versus Christianity you know the two are going to clash the two major religions the two biggest populations pretty much you know religious wise you know with the most power and everything And on one side of the fence is going to be the right side, and on one side is going to be the wrong side. It's pretty simple. There is no gray area in between. So, you're going to have one side for bad and one side for good. And then, they're rallying at the, the ground level of the people. You know, the military junk and everything, that's no big deal to them. They've already controlling that, so they need to get the people. The, the other army on the grounds that will be, you know, already in hate mode, destroy mode, tear your stuff up mode, uh, kill you mode. You know, these are not very, you're stuck with either, they're not very intelligent and they have no brain, or we're really super smart because we don't run around keep look at all the stuff that they say you know over there about who we worship if you're a Christian and we never really hear about it do we maybe they don't allow it you know maybe they're strict on that over there we can't you know we don't see stuff like that or I don't coming out of there you know you see it like on Bill Maher and what or Lewis Black or something or you know other people that poke the fun at religion, and some of them are poking it in uh, vulgar, very vulgar, very hate type of comedy. And uh, we don't like it. We're displeased by it. We're disgusted by it. We stay away from it as much as possible and don't watch it. But yet, we don't go out and kill them. We don't go burn their house. We don't go burn their building. We don't go do like that. 
Oh no, this is somebody else getting this hate up there for later on, so they can use it later on. Of course they're using it now to a degree, but what they're using now is small compared to later on down the line. You know, if this is a re- if just, they, they think you're stupid. If this is supposed to be a reaction, and, and this kind of stuff everywhere starting to come out in different countries and cities, well then what happens whenever the Supreme Leader issues a call for an order for all who are really trustworthy, hardcore, true, true to the bone to go out and do what he says, when he says, how he says, to who he says, if that would ever occur. If this is a reaction to something that's not a command or an order or a plea or whatever it would be, what will the reaction be if they were by their religion and their religious leaders who actually run everything pretty well if they gave an order to go and start killing I think it would be a no-brainer to think that there wouldn't be a whole lot more of them doing stuff and that's what I mean for later on because there will be somebody later on who will give orders like that and there will be a flood, ton of them everywhere following it. So the United States is involved somehow. Um, I just, I got that, everything I went through, I got that feeling we're involved somehow. And uh, this probably got something to do with our corrupt administration. And I think the president himself, <clears throat> if he's got something to do with it, which Man, he's crooked as a, as a, I don't know what, but there ain't nothing that he hadn't done that wasn't crooked so far. So, if he stands to gain or he gets an order from his master and boss, he's going to do it. But if they're going to do any war in Israel or us involved, I think it makes more logical sense to wait until after he re-solidifies his power into his second term and then glorifies himself like he likes to do and then gets all that wrapped up. I just would think that the action is going to come in November. There's some thought maybe a surprise in October and it could be. You know, I, I guess if he, you know, if the powers that be that put him in and control him decide, well, we really ain't made a mind up, you know, we own both of you, so we're just going to sleep on it. And, you know, he gets the shakes or something, you know, maybe he goes and gives an order he shouldn't at a time he shouldn't. Maybe we come early in October to war. As far as the bombs flying, I, I'm not, you know, I, it, everybody's got their secrets. And I think Israel's probably got some secrets. You know, the hardware that you got and what it can do, you know, that's the secret of your power. Have a little more than what everybody knows, right? And that way you know you got a you got the real deal if you ever need to break it out. So they could just, you know, EMP them and take the power out and then do the heavy stuff later on. And then everybody, you know, if the country's around them, if you're not affected, and you know, hey, they, they just got took out with their power EMP, so, hey, we don't want to, we're not going to go ahead and get involved in this. That might be kind of a deal that you would think about. It would be new wave, sort of. And there has been mention of it, I've read, that they were given consideration to that idea at some point. But maybe the idea of rockets flying and air raids, maybe that appeals more. We'll see. I don't think an EMP would actually crush rock and destroy anything. 
like a big heavy bunker buster. And I think these guys were talking about, we'd like to have some of your bunker busters try and get down to those fortified areas. Well, they've discussed the bunker busters and stuff too. These guys have got a pretty good show. I listened to just a couple of, or three minutes or so before. Well, let's go ahead and check it out. Enjoy. And think about what he's saying. Because it makes a lot of sense, and I think he could be right to, to what I've heard so far. Is disengaging Arm ship would stop. Warships exit Tartus. Tartus has a deep water seaport and, and uh, a, a Syrian railhead so that you can offload ships and send war materials in land. Uh, it's a very important stop. The Russians have been there with all their ships. Now, according to this article, there's only one ship left and it will soon be leaving too. What's ha happening, Avi? Well, I believe that we have a di dichotomy in the Islamic world. We have the Sunnis and we have the Shiites. Uh, Iran, which I, of course, call a rogue regime, which most people agree with me, is a rogue regime, is ruled by fanatic Iranian Shiites. Uh, they have allies such as uh, Bashar al-Assad of Syria, who is an Alawite. Alawites are a, a heretical form of Shiite Islam, but they, they, for political and military reasons, they're allied with Iran. Then you have another Shiite group in Lebanon called Hezbollah, and they are fanatic like the Iranians, but the Hezbollah are Arabic speakers. The Iranians are Paris, Paris speakers. And of course the Syrians who are Alawites are Arabic speakers. We've got three different types of Shiite Islam. But they are all allied in one common purpose. And, in, and we, It's called the Shiite Crescent. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq mm -hmm. today, which is 60% Shiite, controlled by Shiites, and Iran. Now the Russians ha have been traditional allies of Iran and Syria. And what I've been saying over the last few years, and I, I, I feel today even more after what you just read, uh, is that the Russians are understanding that the Iranian regime is doomed. The Iranian regime will, will be replaced very soon. Mm. I predict before the American elections. Wow. And um, I think Israel will ha have something to do with a preliminary attack and Obama uh, in order to be reelected, uh, will come to Israel's defense if the war happens a few weeks before the, a few days before the elections in November. The Iranian regime is doomed. The Bashar al-Assad regime is doomed, and I believe Hezbollah is doomed. So, wow, these, so these three are, are going to be terminated. Now, I, I must say quickly that we've talked about Hezbollah. Uh, that's the group of fanatics on Israel's northern border, uh, and they have somewhere between 40 and 60,000 rockets aimed at Israel. They are a fanatic bunch, and they are very, they have a lot of bravado. They, they say, hey, nothing can stop us. Uh, we'll fire all our rockets on Israel. We'll be victorious, and so forth. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, I, I have a lot of Lebanese friends, I have Sunni, Muslim, Lebanese friends, Christian friends, Jewish friends from Lebanon. And they all said to me that in Lebanon, it is the common assertion that Hezbollah Shiites are completely crazy. They're crazy and also slightly mentally retarded. This is how the Lebanese look at the Hezbollah. The problem, as you said, is they have so many arms and so many rockets. And they have been backed all these years by Bashar al-Assad and before that Hafiz al-Assad. Oh. That the Sun 
Sunnis are afraid of them, the Christians are afraid of them, the Druze are also afraid of them. Uh, and Netanyahu has said without any doubt that if Hezbollah starts launching missiles at Israel, in other words, if Israel attacks Iran and Hezbollah comes in, that, that will be not only the end of Hezbollah, it will be the end of Lebanon. So the Lebanese government is very concerned and trying to reel in this crazy bunch of Hezbollah. Uh, uh, so oh, you have to remember that, that these Hezbollah people, uh, they are like the Iranians. They believe that if they all die, the Mahdi, the Tov Mahdi will return. Mm -hmm. uh, they, like, like I said before, they're absolutely convinced they're going to win. Iran <coughs> is absolutely convinced it's going to wipe Israel off the face of the right. earth. So, you know, for those of us who believe in God and believe in the Bible, you know, God says that will never happen. Well, so, and, and when we see the Russians departing in, in a hurry, by the way, this and other news releases we've read note that they are departing quickly as though there's limited time. Yes. Uh, when we see this, what does it tell you? <laughs> well, I believe, like I said before, that the key here is Iran. Uh, Iran is a led. The Iranian people are fantastic people, by the way. You know, you know, under the Shah of Iran, they were allies of America, allies of Israel, until America's president Jimmy Carter brought down your number one ally and stupidly turned Iran into the number one enemy. But the people of Iran are great people. Uh, uh, so I think that a, a number of world leaders, including the Russians, mm -hmm. including the Chinese, who's got God is money. Yes. The Chinese, their God is mammon. Uh, Russia, their God is mammon. Uh, a little bit with, with the Russian Orthodox Church, that's okay. Iran is no friend of anyone un under this present regime. There's only maybe one government that they're really friendly with, and that's North Korea. Yeah, that's another loser. The Iranian regime will be terminated, I believe, very soon. The world needs the Iranian oil. I believe that President Obama, and this is one more proof of what I've, what I've been saying is correct, Justice Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Democratic Socialist President of the United States in World War II, made a deal with Joseph Stalin, dictator of Soviet Union, and he gave Russia half of Europe, which of course is a tremendous tragedy for Eastern Europe. Oh, yes. I believe Obama will give the Russians a very big chunk of Syria, very big chunk of uh, Iran when it's all over. Remember, Iran in World War I was pro Kaiser Wilhelm. Iran was divided up between Britain and Tsarist Russia. World War II, Iran was divided again between the Soviets, the British, and the Americans. You had zones, American zone, British zone. Iran today, I believe, will be divided up. It is a very big country. It's too big for America to handle alone. It's too big for America, Britain, and NATO to handle alone. And I believe it. You can do business with the Russians. Uh, just give them, a, you know, pay the price. Uh, the Russians are like any normal country. They want to have their share of the pie, their slice of the pie. The Chinese want their slice of the pie. Everybody wants the Iranian oil. And so they're going to slice that pie up. And I think the Iranian regime will be overthrown. I, I think I think the, the people of Iran will be offered, will be given democracy, par proportional representation, parliamentary democracy under the auspices of the UN. So and Obama will be the conductor of the orchestra. You're saying that the Russians have seen the handwriting on the wall. Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has plans for what they call a uh, an Islamic caliphate, stretching from from the Atlantic Ocean, North Africa, all the way across North Africa, through Egypt, uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, all the way up through Jordan and, and Iraq and Iran, Pakistan, all the way up to Kazakhstan. And so they have this gigantic image of a caliphate. And they believe that uh, beginning with the, the Arab Spring uprisings, that they're on the verge of creating this caliphate. And and uh, I'd like to talk for you to you for for a moment about 
this group that calls itself the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, fill us in on their influence and where you think they're going now. Okay, well, uh, indeed, as you know uh, from history, and we're both historians, after the collapse of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, uh, 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 you had all these uh, uh, different types of ideology is popping up in the Islamic world. And of course, Lawrence of Arabia uh, and his ideology the of a pan-Arab alliance, which of course, when you see the movie Lawrence of Arabia, at the end of the movie, you see nothing works and all these tribes are fighting each other and yeah. the Islamic peoples are very divisive against each other. Um, in 1929, which is pretty much the same period, this fundamentalist Islamic Sunni ideology develops called the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. 1929, founded by Hassan al-Banna, and uh, this man basically had what would you call an Islamic Nazi ideology. When Hitler came to power four years later, in 1933, the Muslim Brotherhood immediately aligned itself with the Nazis. Wow. Uh, yes. And so the British, when the, when the World War II broke out, the British banned the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, after the British uh, exited uh, Egypt, because Egypt was a colony of England, uh, then when King Farouk became king, he ba continued to ban the Muslim Brotherhood because he realized they were dangerous. Then when King Farouk was deposed in 1952 by Abdul Nasser, Abdul Nasser continued to ban the Muslim Brotherhood. These people have been arrested and tortured and banned. And then Anwar Sadat, the great man who made peace with Israel, said, let's be democratic. Let's release these people from jail. The first thing they did, they killed them. So when Mubarak became president of Egypt for 30 years, the Muslim Brotherhood was banned. Because everyone in their right mind in Egypt understood that the Muslim Brotherhood was not good for the, for the people of the free Egypt. Now, a, a man has just been elected to, uh, to, to the presidency of Egypt. His name is Mohammed Morsi. And... <laughs> He is a he's very big in the, in the Muslim Brotherhood, and he seems to be pulling the strings uh, in the Middle East. He's got his eyes on unification with a, the whatever government replaces the Syrian government right now. Uh, he's got large scale vision going on. What's going to ha happen there? Well, if you're talking about a unification with the uh, the new Sunni Syrian government. We already saw something like this called the United Arab Republic, yes. in which Syria and Egypt became united. It was a mess. It didn't work. And the Syrians broke away from it because the Egyptian leadership wanted everything for Egypt, and the Syrians didn't get anything. So, again, Islam is a very divisive system. These different governments will not be able to work together. These different nations will not be able to work together. But I wanted to stress something very important. And, you know, I have been blessed by God to, to have Rachel as my wife. Yes. Rachel is Egyptian-born Jew. Uh, when she and her family were expelled, penniless, from Egypt, uh, when she was 20 years old, this was in 1969, her Christian girlfriends, classmates, and neighbors were saying, we're sorry to see you Jews leave, because my wife was with the last of the Jewish people leaving Egypt. When you Jews leave, when they're finished with the Saturday people, the Jews, they're going to come to the Sunday people, the Christians. This is 1969. And, and uh, what we have seen in the last 30, 35 years, 40 years, is indeed that the Christians of Egypt are being terribly persecuted. Uh, girls reach puberty and immediately get kidnapped, uh, impregnated by Muslim men, forced to marry Muslim men. Uh, and of course, a Muslim man can marry four wives. So he takes these, they take these teenage Christian girls, kidnap them, impregnate them, force them to marry these Muslim men, and they become, in effect, baby machines for Islam. If they succeed in escaping this house arrest and going back to their families, a mob forms. A Muslim mob forms. They go to the house of the parents. They kill the parents, they kill the woman who's pregnant, they kill the brothers and sisters, they wipe out the family, and of course the 
Egyptian police will not do anything about it because you don't mess with the Muslim Brotherhood. So what you're, you're describing something like La Cosa Nostra, uh, Islamic style. Uh, very, very correct. And this is uh, has turned into a holocaust. And what one of the things, you know, I keep thinking to myself, uh, people are saying, to, why does the U.S. State Department under President Obama uh, support this? And why, why did the administrations before Obama turn a blind eye? To this kind of behavior in Egypt. We're talking about basically 10 million Coptic Christians disappearing. Either they convert, they die, or they flee. When the Bashar al Assad regime collapses, then the Sunnis will take over in Syria, the Alawites will be killed, the Christians will be killed, and the Druze will be killed. So, what we're talking about, in effect, is the termination of Christianity in Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. And I go to churches and I, I, I explain this phenomenon. And I'm going up with Russia in a moment because people are saying, well, if they get rid of their Christians and the Christians in Egypt are hardworking, industrious, and educated, and rich, most of them, and if they are forced to leave Egypt, they're going to take their money with them. And then the Egyptians Egyptian economy it will collapse because the backbone of the Egyptian economy, the backbone of the Syrian economy is the Christians. Lebanon, backbone of Lebanon is the Christians. When these Christians are forced to flee, the economies will all collapse. When the economies collapse of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, what's going to happen? The Muslims are going to starve. When the Muslims starve, what's going to happen? They're going to come here. They're going to come to the United States of America. And so the Russians perhaps have a vision of what you're talking about, and they're fleeing the scene uh, rather than becoming involved in all this. Yes, it, 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 no matter who, who rules in the Islamic world, whether they're Shiites or Sunnis, it's not good for the Jews, not good for the Christians, and not good for the Muslims either. Well, you're listening to Avi Lipkin. Uh, he it is a, a well-known uh, speaker on uh, Israeli affairs and also on Islam. He's written a book speaking of Islam called Return to Mecca. Mecca and Medina, they're sort of mysteries in the Western mind. What goes on there? We hear about the Islamic pilgrimages to Mecca. And we hear about Mecca as this uh, spiritual uh, capital of Islam. And it extremely important, but what's the history of Mecca and Medina? You will be shocked to discover when you read this book, Return to Mecca. I've has done a lot of research and come up with a book, book that I think has the thesis that you'll find in no other book. We're offering it to you for 1995 for shipping and handling, all the number you see on your screen right now, and we'll speed it right to you. Also, if you'd like to get a copy of Prophecy in the News magazine, uh, you can call the number on your screen right now, I'll order Prophecy in the News magazine, thirty-four ninety-five for an annual subscription, 48 color pages, 12 issues. Thirty-four ninety-five and free shipping on that. By the way, just uh, watch that eight hundred number. Uh, order Avi's book. You're in for, for an exciting read. I'm going to change the subject now to your book because this book actually will shed a lot of light uh, on what's happening right now in the, in the Middle East. Very correct. Uh, for most of the viewers of Prophecy in the News over the last decades, and I've been with you guys decades already, yeah. uh, we all understand that there is something called the One World Government. Mm -hmm. The god of the One World Government is mammon, which means money. And so the question that has to be asked, or a rhetorical question, is it in the interest of the One World Government for oil prices to go up to two, three hundred dollars a barrel. Not really. Is it in the interest of the one world government for crazy regime like Iran to do the crazy stuff it's doing? Which, I, of course, the answer is no. Yeah. And I believe the one world government includes Russia, includes China. 
is the God of China and the God of Russia is money. And so one of the things I say in church is, is that I don't believe China is out to destroy America because if America goes, Walmart goes. If Walmart goes, China goes. And so the Chinese are, are um, Chinese hold a lot of American debt. So the Chinese are definitely not interested in the economic collapse of the United States. Uh, the Saudis and the oil-rich Arabs, they have so much money, they don't know what to do with all that money. So the money actually ends up coming back to America in the form of investment takeover of banks and real estate and politicians. And so the, 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 the Russians, too, the Russians are not going to be blessed if America goes down. So I believe the Russians are exiting Syria. They will exit Iran. They will come back, back later when that rogue regime is overthrown and Iran gets divided up between the powers. So you're painting an amazing picture of what's going on in the Middle East right now. And I think most Americans are totally oblivious of the gigantic changes in power uh, just ahead in the Middle East. And of course, there sits right in the middle of all the Arab plans, tiny little Israel, which is, the I think, the bulwark of civilization. Yes. In that area. You know, I uh, had the opportunity of participating in uh, war games at General Staff level in Israel in 1996. And at that time, and we were, were thinking along the lines that Syria and Lebanon, Syria and Hezbollah, would invade Israel from the north, they would occupy Israel from the north, and in the first three days of the war, or they would they would be totally in control of the north of Israel. What, what happened? God was shuffled the deck. God has brought out of about the complete disintegration of Syria, or it's still incomplete, but Syria is now in the direction of being completely disintegrated by this civil war between the, uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis. Uh, what we see now every day, Syrian Air Force her helicopters, Syrian Air Force MiGs are being shot out of the sky by Stinger, which provided to the Sunnis by the Americans and by the Turks. Libya has sent over 20 uh, T-62 Russian tanks uh, uh, to fight uh, the Bashar al-Assad government. So if 80% of the population of Syria is Sunni, Sunnis are going to win. They're backed by the Turks, they're backed by the Egyptians, they're backed by the Libyans, they're backed by Saudi, they're backed by America. So the Russians, I think, have realized the writing on the wall. And I, th I also, like I said before, I believe when we see the showdown with Iran, we will see Israel, America, NATO, all going into Iran, and I believe Russia and China will be allies and not enemies. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Now, I want to go back to to your book, because this book deals with a question. You have to know what the question is. The question deals with Mecca and Medina, and I think Avi, to the Western mind, Mecca and Medina are practically, practically irrelevant. Uh, who cares? But it, in fact, they have a biblical history, and you have introduced us to, to do that in your book. Uh, tell us about that, and tell us about the importance of that area. Well, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, 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 and I, you'll forgive me when I talk about the Bible, I'm going to say it's Saudi Arabia, but even though Saudi Arabia is a new, new name, it's a, uh, after right. World War One, it was just Arabia in those days. Right. And of course, if you read in the New Testament, Galatians 4, verse 25, it says, Hagar and Mount Sinai, which are, are in Arabia. In Arabia. Okay, so like, <clears throat> so the Christians know them. Okay, sure. Uh, my wife and I are very romantic. And uh, instead we're going to blockbusters and getting movies, uh, me and my wife, uh, we watch Saudi TV, we watch <laughs> Al Jazeera, you know, we watch all these Arabic stations, and when they show the uh, imams who are speaking in front of the black stuff from the Kaaba, uh, uh, the imams say, well, we all know that 
Aaron was here, Moses was here, Jethro was here, at the Black Stone. Ah. Everybody knows that. And uh, that the Israelites left Egypt uh, from slavery for 400 years, and they were in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia for 400 years. Uh, and for 40 years, excuse me. Now, there is a couple, uh, by a Christian couple, by name of uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell, yes. and they have written a book on this, and they've made uh, DVDs about this. I work very closely with them. They were in Saudi for 12 years, and they showed beyond any doubt that the 40 years of the exodus were in Arabia. There are sandal markings all over the desert of Saudi Arabia, and in Yemen, and in uh, Iraq, in Basra. Basra is in, mentioned in the Bible. There are many names that are repeated over and over again. The Israelites were there. Um, and God says, uh, of course, you know, if people are watching the show, they don't believe in God, then this might be over their heads a little bit. But people who watch the show and do believe in God and do believe in the Bible, Deuteronomy 11 says, the borders are going to go of Israel are going to go from Lebanon to the desert. So what's the desert? It's not the Negev, because the Negev is Judah. Mm -hmm. It's not the peninsula of Sinai, because that's Pharaonic Egypt. We're talking about 40 years in Arabia. And God says, wherever your feet will tread, I will give to you. The Saudis know this. The Saudis, the Arabs, the Muslims have been saying all along, we must destroy Israel. It's on the cover of my book and he, he says we must what will we do when the Israelis take Medina which they claim as theirs wow now the the, the, uh, the Campbells actually have photographed rocks with sandals right it's as though you traced around your sandal right and sort of etched that out right and the, the Israelis uh, or the Israelites of old apparently recognize that it as a way of marking where they had been. Exactly. And also a very interesting point, which is just now being developed in Israel, that they have found in places in Israel, like in Shechem, Nablus, they found a sandal, a tremendous sandal-type archaeological site uh, in Argaman, which is in the Jordan River Valley. There's certain places in Israel they have these tremendous uh, sites, religious sites, where animal sacrifices took place. Uh, what is a pilgrim? A pilgrim in Hebrew is Olel Regal. Olel Regal means the, the foot. They are going with their feet, or to, they're going to the feet. Uh -huh. Aliyah Regal means they're going up to the sandal marking. So we have these sandal markings all over the Arabian Peninsula. We have them in Israel also. It is all, all connected to the uh, early religion of the Israelites. Hmm. Now, this book is going to give you a, a, a glimpse of prophecy, because things are going to change in the Middle East. Uh, you know what, and I know it. Of course, we teach Bible prophecy here at Prophecy in the News and have uh, for uh, three and a half decades. You know, J.R. Church really started a, an in-depth Bible study project that we're still carrying on to this day. And this will fill in a missing chunk to help you understand Bible prophecy. I want to add something extremely important. The so-called Arab Spring, it came first to Tunisia, mm -hmm. then it spread to Libya, then it spread to Egypt, then to Yemen, then to Syria, now Lebanon. Yeah. I predict in my book that the Arab Spring will come to Saudi. And we know already that Al-Qaeda, who are sons of Saudi Arabia, loyal sons of, of the educational system, the Wahhabi educational system, what are they saying? They're saying we were trained to be Al-Qaeda and the king of Saudi Arabia is working with the Christians. He's working with the West. He's a trader, an infidel, a heretic. Yeah. He's selling them oil. He's investing Islamic money in the Western economies. So we must kill the king. We must kill our king. We must kill these princes who are not loyal to Allah. And so what's going to happen, and this is the bottom line, that the, they're going to start blowing up their oil wells. And then the one world government, 
including the Americans, including the British, British, including the Russians, including the Chinese, they're going to say, no way, Jose, you're not going to blow up those oil wells. We're going to take over all those oil wells. We're going to secure them, we're going to occupy them, and we're going to defend them from any of these crazy pe people who think they're going to blow up the oil wells. That's the one world government. And Israel will be commanded by the one world government to go and take northwestern Arabia, Mecca, Medina, and Mount Sinai, which are all there in front of Israel. Mm. Well, interesting, interesting. Uh, That's I, what the end of the book. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> this is where you'll be led. And, and logically, too, the, the book is called Return to Mecca. Uh, it's really a blockbuster when you read it. 1995 plus shipping and handling. Call the 800 number on your screen right now. Also, uh, please avail yourself of uh, our monthly magazine. Uh, Twelve uh, issues per year, 48 pages, uh, and lots of articles on Bible prophecy, lots of special uh, notices in the pages of this uh, of this magazine on publications just like Avi's. You wouldn't find out about them any other way, but we are bringing you lots of prophecy studies and authors who write on Bible prophecy. Uh, Avi, in just about a minute, you've written five, five other books besides the one we're offering today. Go through those quickly, and I know it has to be quickly. Yes. Uh, and because we're still offering these, these books, and if you want them, you can find them on our website. This book is extremely important because it shows 9-11 happening four years. This was written four years before 9-11. Mm -hmm. It predicted 9-11. It talks about Mubarak and the military thinking of the Egyptian generals, right. which is leading to war. And chapter 19 talks about the satanic verses that are in the Quran. Satanic Islam, a global threat. The second book, A Christian Revival for Israel Survival, was a call to Christians to stand with Israel, because very simply, the Jews, who used to be number two in America, are now number three, and the Muslims outnumber the Jews five to one. Mm -hmm. So the Christians must stand with us. This is an extremely important book because it has an article from 10 years ago about a Chinese-built missile base in Saudi Arabia with Chinese Dongfeng missiles and Pakistani nuclear warheads. This is the only book in the world that has it. This is about the Judeo-Christian Bible Bloc Party coming to be birthed in Israel hopefully this November. Uh, this, of course, is the prelude to the, the sixth book. This is Genesis, this is Exodus, and, and together they show the threat of Islam and the final solution to defeating Allah and sending him to the pits of hell for a thousand years. He, he did it in less than a minute. Thank you, Avi, and uh, once again, and uh, the book we're offering you right now is Well, that's a rather interesting thought about how we would take over the oil wells as part of the global NWO. But those were these guys' thoughts and what they think may be coming down the pipes in the Middle East coming soon. Hopefully not to our neighborhood, but we got other stuff to deal with. We got Earthquakes, we got New Madrid, we got the sun, we're coming into solar max, the later we go into this year, we'll be reaching next year obviously when they predicted it. Oh. This has gotten to be pretty long because we listened to their whole show. But I just think it's the way it looks to me. You know, it looks different to everybody that thinks about it. But I just don't buy the video. I just think it's all orchestrated and it's being fanned. They're going to keep doing it until it's time. Move on down the line to the next stage. And they're going to use all this anti sentiment. Just choose up your sides, us against you kind of 
that kind of a hatred. And that'll set up the stage for the big dance. I don't know about saving them oil wells like he was thinking and taking that over and running them. It could be. We'll have to see and keep our eyes open. There's a lot of no cut down intended to anyone. But it just is true. There's a lot of people that look but they don't see. And a lot of people that listen but they don't hear. And a lot of people that think, but they don't realize and understand. So, I did have another one I'm putting that up about uh, food, genetically altered foods. I'll be getting that up pretty soon after this one. I'll let everybody go. Tomorrow's for, uh, Thursday. We're getting close to the weekend. Thank goodness. Y'all take care. God bless, and I'll talk to you. Well, not too long from now. I'm gonna look more, a little more into these articles on the wars that may be coming up. See if I can find anything that I didn't find before. So good night, and God bless.